Shalom, and welcome to Via Hafta Yisrael, a Hebrew phrase which means you shall love Israel. We hope you'll stay with us for the next 30 minutes as our teacher, Dr. Baruch, shares his expository teaching from the Bible. Dr. Baruch is the senior lecturer at the Zera Avraham Institute based in Israel. Although all courses are taught in Hebrew at the Institute, Dr. Baruch is pleased to share this weekly address in English. To find out more about our work in Israel, please visit us on the web at loveisrael.org. That's one word, loveisrael.org. Now, here's Baruch with today's lesson. Our focus in this chapter from the prophecy of Isaiah is Israel. And we have seen that God is not pleased with his people. He has testified that they approach him with their mouth. They honor him with their words, but their hearts are far removed from him. It speaks about how Israel is not a covenant-keeping people. They are far removed from the purposes of God. But here's the good news. God is going to bring about a change with his people. Not because they deserve it, not because they approach him with a repentant heart and now he's going to work in their life. That's not what Isaiah reveals. God's going to do it because he is the God of Israel. And the reason why he moves to bring about this change is because he has entered into a covenant with them. And it's this covenant that brings about this great and wonderful change. So with that said, take out your Bible. We'll pick up where we left off last week in the book of Isaiah and chapter 29. The book of Isaiah and chapter 29. We're going to begin in verse 14. Now remember, God has just said, the heart of the people is far from me. But in verse 14, we read, therefore, behold. And this is a way to say that something significant in this context, something dramatic is about to happen. And it's the word hineni, which is a covenantal related word. We see that the patriarchs use that word in regard to their willingness to submit to God for a covenantal purpose. And in this same way, God is saying, Hineni, behold, I, God's going to move. Why? This covenantal commitment. So we see here, therefore, behold, I, and it's a word to continue that God's going to add something. He is going to bring something into this situation. And what he's going to bring is indeed going to be that catalyst for a change, a change that's going to please him. So therefore, I'm continuing, and this next word is a word for that which is wondrous. It is a synonym for a miracle. It's in the verb form, so God is making a promise. Isaiah is revealing that God will continue. And again, this has last days, end time significance. And God is saying that I will continue, and we can understand it this way, in the last days. For the conclusion of this world, in light of his covenantal promise to establish a kingdom, God is going to continue to do that which is wondrous. In fact, we see here that he is going to do that which is wondrous specifically to this people. Or we could translate it perhaps a little bit more accurately with this people. God is going to do that which is wondrous with this people. Now, here again, it is impossible to look at Scripture, prophetic passages that clearly, and there is indications that this is a last day context, and not see God reaffirming his covenantal love, his covenantal purposes with the people of Israel. 
He is going to show himself faithful. And this is what this verse is revealing. Therefore, behold, and we could understand it, behold me, and it's God speaking. Behold, I am continuing to do that which is wondrous with this people. And then he says, he, and it's a verb for doing that which is wondrous, and then the noun for that which is a wonderful or a marvelous occurrence. So he will do in a wondrous way wondrous things. Three times this word is used here to speak about that which is not normal, that which is not natural, that way, the only way to understand it is that which is supernatural in a marvelous, wonderful manner. And it's going to bring a change. Keep reading in verse 14. The wisdom of his wise ones, and his is the people, not God, but, but the people. So people in Hebrew is the word am. We would say they're wise ones because we think of people usually in the plural sense, referring to a group. So in our estimation, we could translate it that the wisdom of their wise ones will perish. And the understanding of those who are, and it's a synonym for wisdom, understanding, knowledgeable ones. So those that possess understanding, it says they are going to, and this is to, to hide it, conceal it, because they're going to recognize that their understanding, their wisdom, their knowledge is, is so less than the wondrous God and what he's able to do. So there's going to be a change among the people, verse 15. There's going to be some that do not want to submit to this change, that will not acknowledge this wondrous God, this miracle-working God of Israel. And what will they do? Well, he says, hoy, how awful, how awful it's going to be for those that, that conceal. And this is a word to, to put something low. In the noun, it's the word for valley. So this is making something low, trying to conceal it, bury it from the Lord. And then we have to conceal, a different word, but, but same intent, to conceal counsel. And this is the advice. The implication is this. There are those that, that give advice, that tell people what they should be doing. And in the midst of God renewing his covenantal relationship, bringing about a covenantal outcome to those promises, what happens? There's going to be those who are rebellious, and they will want to cover up, hide, bury, conceal what, what they are saying. But notice what else is pointed out. Those whose works will be in darkness. Those who say, who will see? Who will know? And this is the problem. They're saying no one will know what we are doing. No one will see what we're doing. And this attacks the real identity of God. Let me give you an example. Recently, someone sent me a, a, a citation from a book that was written by a fellow Israeli. He's a believer, a leader of an organization here in Israel. And in this book, which he calls Alignment, there is a heretical statement. What is that statement? I'm going to paraphrase, but I'm going to get it very, very close. He says that God knows almost everything. That's false. God knows everything. But this individual says God knows almost everything. And, and this is by design. He gives us free will, which I would agree with that. He gives us free will to do the things so that we surprise him. Now, we do not surprise God. There is nothing that happens 
that God does not know. In fact, I'm amazed because this individual, as I said, he lives here in Israel. He speaks Hebrew. He knows that, that the most sacred name of God, those four letters, yud heh vav -Hey, comes from the Hebrew word to be, which speaks about the God who was and is and will be. It speaks about how God transcends times. So because God transcends time, there's not anything that's in the future to him. He sees everything. When did he see everything? Always. There was never a time that God did not know all things at all times. Nothing, nothing surprises God. And this false teaching is exactly the attitude of the people that they believe they can conceal, hide, bury what they're telling people, that they can do that and no one will see us, no one will know what we're doing. Falsehood. Verse 16. God is pointing out that there needs to be a total overturning of, of how people think. And this is what he's going to bring about. And why does there need to be that, that overturning? Look at verse 16. There's going to be this overturning. Why? God will overturn you because. This is the attitude. He says, will the, the clay think of the, the one, the potter, as, as clay? Will he say the one that, that was worked out, made, to the one who made him? You have not done it. And will that which is created say to his creator, you, you don't understand. Now, all of this, if we go back and we see three examples, it says that the, the clay will think of himself as the potter. The problem is, the, the purpose is to show that the people are thinking of themselves as God. That is their will, their counsel, their ways, they believe are right, not the ways of God. And they believe that they can conceal things from God in order that in the end, they can't triumph and their desires will be fulfilled. This is what God is going to change. He is going to show people that this is not correct. He is going to overturn such a way of thinking. Look at verse 17. In verse 17, it begins with the phrase, the Hebrew word, hello, which is a, a strong word. We usually translate it surely, meaning this is going to be. It emphasizes, it makes it emphatic. And he's saying, surely, just a little bit more. And the Lebanon will be returned to a fruitful land. And the fruitful land as a forest will be thought of. Now, what he's saying here is there's going to be a change. That which is great is going to be lessened. And that which is not so great is going to become great. So the Lebanon, we're talking about the cedars, those large trees, says it's going to be likened as simply a, a fruitful uh, piece of land. That's a reduction. And that fruitful piece of land is going to be thought of as a force. So it's taking that which is high, bringing it low. That which is low is going to be taken up. It's the same concept as those who exalt themselves will be humbled. Those who are humbled, they're going to be exalted. It's all supporting this change that God, this covenant-keeping God, is going to make among his people. Verse 18. It begins with the phrase, Be'yom ha'hu, on that day. Now, literally, the phrase or the word, Ve'sham'u, this is the verb. They will hear. 
who will hear. But first it tells us when they're going to hear this, and that's on that day. And hopefully by now you know that that phrase, on that day, is a, a hint. It is a scriptural clue that the context is the last days. That, that day of judgment when God brings low those that are prideful and those who are humble, he raises up, he establishes things according to his purposes. So on that day, the deaf, they will hear the words of the book. Now, what book? The rabbinical scholars has say that this has to do with God's revelation. His, and sometimes the word sefer, is thought of as a scroll. Normally the word megillah is scroll. But it's a, a book. It's something written down for the purpose of revelation. So God's going to, in the last days, bring a change. Those who were deaf are going to hear the words of revelation, of a book. And from gloom and from darkness, the eyes of the humble they will see. So those that have been placed in gloom and darkness, this is, according to the, the sages of old, this gloom and darkness is a representation of this world. And this world conceals the truth of God. That's what it's about. That's what it means when it says, calls good evil and evil good. So at that time, in the last days, there's going to be illumination given. Those that, as it says here, those who were deaf, they're going to hear the words of revelation. Those who dwell in this world, in the world of darkness and gloom, it says the humbled ones, their eyes are going to see. Verse 19. And the humble ones, they will continue in the Lord with gladness. Now, it's probably more accurate to say the humble ones in the Lord, they will increase gladness. They are going to see God adding to them this glad, that glad uh, outcome from God's activity in the last days. And the ones who are poor among men, it says in the Holy One of Israel, they're going to rejoice. So we're beginning a time because of that important phrase, Be'yom ha'hu, on that day, we're seeing a change, a restructuring, a reordering of things. And it all comes from the God who sees all, knows all, who has all power to bring it about, and he's going to do that according to his covenantal promises this is what isaiah is manifesting revealing to us verse 20 for and the next word ephes ephes is zero nothing it speaks about the outcome of god's change his judgment in the world and he will bring that one who is and this is a individual that is a source of terror this one who threatened individuals this one who is a tyrant, we might say. That one is going to be brought to nothing. And also the scoffer, the mocker. This one is going to be brought to an end. He is going to reach his conclusion. In other words, those who scoff at the things of God, they are not going to endure. They're going to be brought to their end. And finally it says, all the ones. And the next word is a word for being diligent. Being hard working, committed to something. But here's the problem. What are they committed to? What are they diligent in? Well, we have the word aven. What's aven? It's one of the biblical words for that which is wicked. Wickedness. Ungodliness. That which is an abomination to God. Those that are committed to, to wickedness, it says they are going to be cut off. Cut off from what? The covenantal promises, verse 21. Now, in verse 21, we're going to see that, that this passage has to do with 
with justice. We could see, say, in our language today, the halls of justice. But biblically, we know this, that we know that justice was administered at the gate, and this is going to be relevant in just a moment. So look at verse 21, it says, and from those that are going to be, we might say, indicted to be made sinful by, by a word. So there's going to be those that try to indict, convict, uh, shame an individual with just a word. And also the ones who, who uh, are reproved where at the gate, the gate of the city is going to be a snare. So here's what it's saying. One who is tried there, maybe, maybe he's, he's guilty and he's coming there to, to have justice administered. But instead of justice being administered, words are going to be say, said that, that in the end bring him down in a more extreme fashion. Likewise, we could understand it, one's coming for justice. He might be innocent. But the words are going to be say that, that convict him, that indict him, that, that cause him to be guilty, this false word. Likewise, the, the place of justice where justice is supposed to be administered, it is going to become a snare. So regardless, if one is there repentant, coming there for, for justice, meaning in order to, to pay his, his debts to society, it's going to be not something that one is affirmed, punished, but, but affirmed for his repentance, for his acknowledgement. No, there's nothing that's going to be done in a proper manner, manner at this place of justice. Look at how it ends. They turn with nothingness, the righteous one. They have nothing, but they turn against this one who is righteous, or they make righteousness into nothing, however you want to understand it. But what this verse is saying is that the judicial system was corrupt. It does not administer justice, not to those that are guilty and come and, and seek a just sentence for their actions, and those who are innocent, they are going to be convicted. So they turn the justice that's supposed to be administered there into nothing. And by the way, this word for, for nothing is a word tohu. It is the word that we see that describes creation in its original state, where it says that in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And in verse two, it says, and the earth was void or formless, what does that mean? It lacked the order. And this is what it's saying here, that, that justice lacks order. There's nothing that's being administered properly at the halls of justice, at the gate of the city. Therefore, look at verse 2. Therefore, thus says the Lord to the house of Jacob. Now, all of this passage is about God's people. And what's going to bring the change that he's alluded to? What is going to be this wonderful act? Well, what is it? Notice what he speaks about here, verse 20, 22. Therefore, thus said the Lord to the house of Jacob. This is in, it's in the past. Many Bibles incorrectly translated, thus says. But this is in the terminology that God is making a promise. That's why it's in the past tense. So thus said the Lord God to the house of Jacob. What is he going to do? Who redeemed Avraham. It all is calling us to remember this Abrahamic covenant. And what is the one or who is the one who's foundational in this Abrahamic covenant? It is Messiah. Whenever we have a reference to Abraham, 
We should think about God's promise to Abraham and Abraham's faith in the promises of God. And as Paul teaches us, foundational to all this is the work of Messiah. He's going to be the one. Messiah himself is going to be the one that brings this change. Verse 22 again. Therefore, thus said the Lord to the house of Jacob, who redeemed, this is God, redeemed Avraham. And he says, not now, not at this time. Because of the outcome, the results of redemption, he says, no longer is how we might be able to understand it in English. No longer, not at this time and no more, will Jacob be ashamed. And not now, meaning no longer, will his face be pale. And the scholars tell us that a pale face has to do with an idiom for being ashamed being someone who's embarrassed we would say red face but biblically it speaks about those that have been exposed that the color goes out from from their their skin because of shame this is what he's saying that the change is going to bring about for the children of israel called jacob verse 23 now i've mentioned many times that there is a, a reference to the next generation prophetically. And we don't oftentimes have simply the phrase, Dor Haba, the next generation, but we have hints. We have things that point to that next generation. And biblically speaking, prophetically, that next generation is the kingdom generation, where God's going to work to fulfill his, his covenantal promises and to establish the kingdom. So when the next generation is alluded to in a biblical text, we should think about the fulfillment of, of God's covenantal responsibilities, his promises, his blessings to his people. That's what we see in verse 23. Let's read it. For when he sees, who's the he? Jacob. So when Jacob sees his children the work of my hand in his midst so it's telling god's going to work god is going to bring a change in one sense we could understand it very literally that jacob remember jacob this one who is passionate committed that pursued the promises of god that's why he was holding on to his brother's heel this is why he bought the birthright. This is why he went at his mother's instruction based upon God's prophetic revelation to his mother, why he went in and got the blessing. All of this was at the will of God. God said it was going to be. This is why God says, Jacob, I have loved and Esau, I have hated. This is why in the New Covenant, in the book of Hebrews, it says Esau is a perverse and wicked man. So Jacob, he is going to see his offspring, his children, and the change that God's going to bring about the work of my hand in his midst. And they, referring to that next generation, his offspring, they will sanctify my name. They will sanctify the Holy One, the Holy One, and it has here, of Jacob, meaning the God of Jacob. It, it shows this close relationship between God and Jacob. Why? Because of this covenantal agreement. It's that covenant that makes them unified. They're in that, that eternal relationship. So they are going to sanctify, and sanctification has to do with the purposes of God, the plans of God. It continues on in verse 23. And the God of Israel, it says, they will fear. What does this mean? They're going to give God priority. They, instead of being rebellious, them, instead of perverting justice, 
God is going to overturn that, that spirit of disobedience, that pride, that, that idea that they know better. He's going to change all of that to the extent that they are going to give God priority over every aspect of their being. That's why he says, the God of Israel, they will fear. Verse 24, our last verse. Toe ruach. Toe means those who have gone astray. So the ones who have erred, we might say, in the spirit. They have not followed the leadership of the spirit of God. They have been pursuing that which reflects a spiritual heir. It says they are going to know understanding. And the ones who have been complaining, what does that mean? Those who have not rejoiced in the things of God. We see the children of Israel in that wilderness during those 40 years. They complained. They complained. Why? They weren't wanting to go where God was taking them. They did not want to learn the teaching that God wanted to teach them. They did not want to follow all these things that God says, you need to become my people. So they complained, they complained, and they complained. And God is saying, so significant, he is saying, those complainers, it says, they are going to learn, and this word is lekach, we would translate it perhaps the best word for our own understanding. They are going to learn the lesson. Now the word lekak comes from the Hebrew word to take or to receive. And God is saying they're finally going to take hold, they're going to receive of the teaching, my truth. And all of this is going to have a wondrous, remember how this section began in verse 14, three times that word for that which is wondrous is mentioned. God is going to bring a wondrous outcome to the house of Jacob. That next generation, that kingdom generation, is going to be transformed. He's going to overturn all those things that were based upon rebelliousness, based upon pride. He is going to overturn them and turn them into that which God is going to use for his glorious purpose, to achieve his will. So Isaiah chapter 29, this last part shows God's faithfulness to bring a glorious change to Jacob, to Israel, to his covenant people, to the Jewish people, in order that the kingdom promises might be fulfilled. And that's good news for all of humanity who has entered into that new covenant through Messiah Yeshua. I'll close with that. Until next week, Shalom from Israel. Well, we hope you will benefit from today's message and share it with others. Please plan to join us each week at this time and on this channel for our broadcast of loveisrael.org. Again, to find out more about us, please visit our website, loveisrael.org. There you will find articles and numerous other lectures by Baruch. These teachings are in video form. You may download them or watch them in streaming video. Until next week, may the Lord bless you in our Messiah Yeshua, that is, Jesus, as you walk with Him. Shalom from Israel. Thank you.